All right, everyone, let's get started. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you all to part one of our series on mapping the curriculum for a responsive learning environment. Before we dive in, I'd like to give a quick introduction to our incredible speakers for this series. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Heidi Hayes Jacobs. Heidi is the founder and president of Curriculum Designers. She has helped schools and other organizations create modern learning environments, update curriculum, and support teaching strategies for over 30 years. Her models on curriculum mapping and curriculum design have been featured in more than 13 books and software solutions throughout the world. Hi, Heidi. Please also give a warm welcome to Dr. Marie Hubley Alcock. Marie is the founder and president of Learning Systems Associates. She has worked in public and private education as a teacher, administrator, and public advocate for the last 25 years. She has written more than 10 books on curriculum, instruction, and assessment design. Her focus has been working with schools to improve student achievement, multi-purpose mapping, instructional practices, and more. This series is brought to you by Chalk. Chalk is a planning and analytics platform that enables K-12 schools and districts to develop a cohesive standards-aligned map for curriculum and instruction. Chalk supports millions of educators and thousands of schools across, uh, throughout the world. To learn more about Chalk or to get support on your curriculum initiatives, please visit chalk.com demo. Now, without further ado, I'll hand things off to Marie to get things started. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. We're happy to see you here and Heidi and I are both very passionate about our topic today. So we're going to have a good time. Our uh, learning targets for, well, our essential question for the session as it always starts off is how can we prepare our learners for the future, for their future? Okay, so in, in this case, I think I want to back up a little bit here. We do have learning targets for today. I apologize, but controlling the, here we go. Heidi and I organized this around three major learning targets for us as learners. We know in the virtual environment, a lot can happen, but for our session, the first one is I can explain how the structural nest impacts curriculum designs. And we're gonna introduce you to the idea of the structural nest over the next two sessions. I can explore different spaces and furniture features that impact curriculum design choices and the possibilities for that learning environment through them. And then the last one, I can explore different schedules in terms of time and time organizing that respond to the needs of learners and open up possibilities. Okay. So in this space, our learners, uh, when we think about curriculum, we think about our learning environments, um, it really has come to pass that learners today, if we describe them as contemporary learners, right? They have different uh, occupations they're heading for, different skill sets that they need. What they really deserve and what they need to make this work for them are modern learning environments, the physical spaces and the tools that we use. Which leads us to this idea of a structural nest, as I mentioned in the learning targets before. And Heidi Hayes Jacobs and I wrote about this in our book, Bold Moves. And it was a major part of trying to figure out how to approach a, a contemporary curriculum. And we were like, hey, even if I had the most amazing curriculum and I could laminate it, 
Um, I really can't present it effectively. That was a joke. You're all very serious. We'll work on this um, without considering the space that I'm teaching it in or the amount of time that I'm allotting to it because time is curricular destiny or even how I'm grouping the students and who they're connecting to in that moment and how I'm pairing and connecting the adults who are working in that space and in that time and with those students. And so we realized, oh no, this is fully interconnected. I could map an amazing curriculum, but if I don't have a conversation about this structural nest, I'm going to run into stresses and points where it's not working the way I was hoping for it to work. Heidi? Yes, thanks, Marie. And I'm really happy to be working with you today. Um, there's four structures that Marie references. And here's something I bet a lot of you will appreciate. One of the problems comes from good intentions. A good intention is a school will say, we're gonna work on our schedule and we're gonna make that schedule really support teaching and learning. But they didn't look at how they grouped the kids or the teachers are still isolated or they're very limited or restricted in the way they're using spaces. So our point here is the whole is the sum of the parts. It's the orchestration of that nest that will allow you to have responsive, intelligently designed, and really engaging types of learning experiences. We've spent such a big part of our careers on curriculum mapping and the design of it, but what's totally clear is it sits in this nest. The chart, which is in bold moves for schools, um, we've made a, it available to you and you will be able to get a PDF of this following the webinar. Um, I'm not going to go through this in enormous detail, but what we want to show you is if we were to look at your school, you could potentially have antiquated schedules and pretty well-developed use of space. You might have old style grouping and your teachers might be in silos. And then we wonder why isn't it successful? So we're going to dive in this a webinar and then the subsequent one that follows. We're going to start by just zooming in on two, on space and on schedule. And then the next sessions, we'll talk about grouping of kids and personnel. But please know, we can go in and, and examine them. But when we come back out, we have to see how they work in concert. Thanks. So right now, we're going to zoom in on physical spaces and virtual spaces, learning spaces. We want to encourage you to expand your view of school design. We're going to be looking at, at a lot of images that are quite exceptional because it is happening. And there's something about seeing the imaginative reconceptualization of space in school that changes our whole idea of possibilities. But even in modest ways, in existing fairly traditional environments, you can make those shifts. We'll be looking at furniture as a sculpting tool, outdoor spaces, off-campus spaces, learning spaces at home, and certainly the ways we think about the strategic use of, of, of um, virtual space. So let's begin by looking at this. Next slide, please. And one of the things that we do know is a rigid classroom layout creates rigid teaching and learning. It's restrictive. And when you see all the students in rows day after day after day, there's a message there. You know, the message is if I'm a student, I'm a receptacle, the teacher's a dispense, dispenser and literally stay in line. Next slide. So when we think about spaces now, the, the, the first shift that we're inviting you to make is to shift from who's the space for. The space is for the learner, a learning environment, not adult storage, not adult organization. And so when we make that shift, you look at a, a space like this, take a couple of notices right off the bat. Look at the use of the lighting. Look at the calm nature of it, thinking spa, right? There's not a lot of overstimulation of a lot of images. Notice the shelves are empty. So if we thought about the shelves in our learning spaces as for the students, 
What would they look like? How would their work start to fill that space? Also notice the, what would happen with sound here. These two young ladies here are working together in a space. They can be as loud as they want without disrupting the whole group. Let's keep looking at some. You're also going to have conversations about what we call motivational spaces. So motivational spaces are spaces that make the, the brain want to be in your classroom. Is there something beautiful, particularly awesome? Is the door perfectly sized for the size of the learner? Or in this case, look at this slide, right? So who would want to go into this slide? Let me tell you right off the bat, the middle school teachers all love going down this slide. But the idea is, do I have something about the space that, that attracts me as opposed to I need to be here and there's things that are actually distracting me from being here? We're also going to talk about inspirational spaces, this idea of encouraging the type of thinking that we want the students to be having. So we're going to say things, if I have to do courageous thinking, where would I want to physically be? Probably not in the middle of a room with everyone seated around me, right? So in this space, look at the use of color. You look at the impact of light. So this is the kind of a space where we think of a hallway space or a muster space where students can sit and be inspired. It's intentionally done. I'm trying to click the button. I really am. Okay, so in this one, one last point for me on, uh, oops, yeah. I know, right? I, I was yeah. worried that it was happening. It's all right. It's just because I clicked it twice. I'm, it's coming back. One of the things that um, we want to talk about is when we see something like this, see how the students are laying down right there and relaxing. They're comfortable. Remember what I said about courageous thinking. If you want students to know how to sit in an interview or know how to be an appropriate audience with proper respect, then Heidi and I are going to say, make sure that's one of your learning targets and that you set it up and that that's how the students know they're supposed to be at that time. But if I try to maintain that at all times, what happens is I'm never opening up the opportunity for different kinds of thinking and different kinds of experiences. Heidi? Yes, um, to pick up on that point, this is actually two images, and um, we totally appreciate that these are perhaps unusual for your own setting. But here's the important point. This is the way new buildings are being built. And even if we don't use them all, so many of these are in fairly traditional settings. Both of these are, this is what we call a pop-up space. This, this is a movable. And What's interesting here is, yes, Anne-Marie is absolutely spot on. The kids are relaxed, but they're focused. You know, they, they, it's like the amphitheater effect. And so if the teacher needs to talk to them for 20 minutes, they'll pay attention because they know they are going to be able to move on to another space. The other thing are cubbies or smaller spaces. We often think of those for the little kids. That's not true. We all gravitate to towards those types of spaces for social interaction or for study. Next slide, please. In this one, which I think is really interesting, um, is this, this space is a designated seminar room and that you see and behavior changes. They, student behavior changes for a space. Think about the, the difference between being in a stadium, the kind of behavior there, that's appropriate versus maybe going into a seminar space where you're around a table, you're expected to do interaction. There could be a flat screen TV or some kind of a interaction uh, with a school on the other side of the world for that matter. But what I also like is the area outside the seminar space is more open seating. You know, in many of the images you've seen, there are no teachers walking around. Even from that first one Marie started us with, Students respond to spaces very, very well. They take to them like ducks in water. We get so worried they're going to run wild. They don't. They're highly responsive and, in fact, step up, especially with a little bit of coaching and guidance. This is a soundproof uh, space that would be terrific for kids to practice singing or speeches or 
if you as a teacher had had a hard day, be a nice place for you to go in and let off a little steam at the end of the day too. But the idea here is, is it doesn't have to be big. But I, I saw one um, on a trip. I was in Australia. Uh, it was right before the pandemic. And I saw a school where that soundproof space was one of the most popular spaces for all of the different teachers. And kids would go in and practice. They'd, they'd, they'd run their lines before making a presentation. They would also have sometimes discussion groups. There was something very inviting about having that space. Now, this is a personal favorite. This is from a Principia school in St. Louis, Missouri. And they took their library and redid it in a very inexpensive way and created what are innovation labs. Look at this, it's very, very straightforward. Notice again, there's not a teacher in any of these cubbies. And what you see is kids interacting, standing tables, sitting, they have the, the writables on the wall, they're interacting. And, and that means now wait, let's go back to where we started. If I have an innovation design lab, then I need a curriculum where I design innovations. And so the idea is sometimes the space is an inducement for teachers to rethink the way, not only we'll get to grouping later, but the nature of the, of the type of interactions that occur. Thank you. So right now, what we want to do is in the chat, we're going to take just a moment and we'll pull you back shortly. But we'd like everybody to, if you would, use your imagination for a minute. Give us an example of an instructional space that enhanced your students' experience. Some way you might have used an existing space in your school differently. Uh, let's take a minute and see what comes up. Outdoor tents. Oh my gosh, that's terrific. I'm looking at these. <laughs> Oh, you are. A learning commons, rooftop garden, coffee shop, study nook. Oh, these are terrific. Foucault's pendulum down a salt well. Oh my gosh. I want to, Todd, Todd from Texas. Good to see you. <laughs> you have some great spaces there. The coffee shop idea, that is a, we've, we're seeing a lot of schools taking those large cafeterias that we used to um, fill all the kids in for the eating and instead creating cafe nooks, Heidi, and taking yes. that cafeteria space to be the greatest learning suite in the whole it, school. It, it's absolutely true. I'm, <laughs> I am knocked out. Peace and forgiveness garden. My gosh, this is amazing. Look what it's you're doing. Rooms. And here's the point. <laughs> Here's what's interesting objectively. If you could, we could all look at this for a minute. Just read through this list yourself. I mean, Sarah, can we save the chat on this? Is that, can we do that? Is that possible to save yeah. the chat? Yes, we can. All right, because that's worth looking at. And if as a faculty, you look even in many of these are existing spaces that are used more imaginatively, it electrifies kids. You begin to think very differently about your designs. So uh, I applaud you, uh, as does Marie. We're both very enthused about what we're seeing. Let's continue on here. Thank you. Marie? So one of the things we've learned as we were working through, how do I match my contemporary curriculum to a contemporary space? Um, was how existing schools are using their spaces now with specifically hallways. I was floored by the knowledge that almost 30% of the budget with, for a building, heating, cooling, cleaning, was used for spaces that had nothing to do with the instructional and curricular actions that were going on with students. It was just the hallways because we kept making these long hallways with, with classrooms that would just shoot off of them. And so what schools have started to do, especially if they can't build a whole new big building or do something like that, but re- Think the hallway space. So in what you're looking at here used to be your stereotypical hallway. 
right? And so by rethinking the space, look what we've got. We've got breakout spaces. We've got spaces where students, teachers, and small groups can collaborate, work together. And with the use of furniture, I can even cue for different kinds of thinking or communication. Do I want kids to be able to work on their own? Then make these little stations see against the window where the students can sit and work on their own. But if I want them to collaborate, have the, the couches where they can sit facing each other. Um, rethinking hallway space, if that's all you do, you will open up the opportunities for learning suites and these nice kind of commons rooms that we were hearing about in the chat. Now, this space is kind of a different view from what we were looking at before. But when I was talking about having spaces design the kind of thinking or communication, look at this table. Look how these students are working. If one student wants to work on their own, or if two need to get really close and work on space together, you really want, and we're seeing these organic shapes, also note the use of bright color as a highlight color, not overstimulation across the whole space. Students today are visually stimulated. We need to calm it down. And on that note, notice the use of lighting here. OK, it's not just the fluorescence coming down. It's not so expensive to create these light features now to really make it a workable space and one that's neurologically safe. One more point on neurological safety. I love this image. Look at what's going on with this furniture. Look at the use of height. Look at the use of texture. So if I were to say to everyone in this group, I'm about to assign an incredibly challenging task. You're going to get to pick where you want to be in this space. Where would you personally want to go? Maybe some of you want to go in the breakout room over there and be able to shut the door or work quietly. Maybe some of you would hang over that green part or maybe just sit on the curb. And maybe some of you would tuck your back into that corner at the top of the staircase, right? You'll get a sense of security up there. The point here is students, especially when we want them to do critical thinking or courageous thinking, we really have to have a variety of space options and height options for them to do that. Heidi. Yes, um, I think elevated spaces are like the feeling you've got as a kid in a tree house. There's something playful about him. What we know is it's not just for younger children. And in fact, you'll see some images coming up. Um, I want you to pay attention to them, that it's that there's this whole area of space above us in classrooms that aren't, aren't used. Um, um, I saw one recently, an image from a school in um, uh, outside of, in Ottawa area, and they had used their classrooms where it actually was like two levels, not just a, a, a loft, but they actually really had used the space brilliantly because it was an older building that happened to have really big rooms. And the teachers and the architects took advantage of that. There's some great things to think about in terms of space above us, as well as space on the ground. Um, next slide, please. And it introduces and gets us rolling into one of our favorites and that has to do with furniture. Um, I love this image. <laughs> Don't you? I wish I had one of these in my house right now. I mean, there's something playful, relaxed, and also just sort of that image with the perspective of the, um, the sort of imaginative forest play area too. But what it is, is furniture is a sculpting tool. Uh, I don't know what you're sitting in right now, what kind of chair, or if you're on a couch or where you are, but the old view of furniture is over, just over. None of us would go home to our houses with an old style high school metal chair. Honey, get out the high school chair. I want to relax. It doesn't happen. And that's because it actually contradicts the, the way kids learn. And Marie will get a little bit more into the brain research on this, but here's the bottom line. All chairs are the same size then you've got kids who are all different sizes. So when you watch a high school kid who's six foot two, really having trouble getting comfortable in the chair, his energy isn't on the focus. His energy is trying to get his body to work where you've got him next to a girl who might be five foot one, 
whose feet don't touch the ground and she's struggling too. This furniture we want you to look at is not only um, about using the spaces, it's really fundamental to student concentration as well. So we're gonna run through a few quick images here to show you some of the things that you'll see companies and catalogs beginning to produce. There's a lot of work with booths. You'll see a lot more work with curtains and corridors. You'll see the cafe model that works. You'll see that it's more malleable than it used to be. Next slide. You'll also notice this notion of sculpting. I really like this idea that the furniture can take, even in both of these rooms, which are traditionally just big rectangular spaces, but they create something that um, we often hear from our architectural friends called learning suites. And the concept is absolutely applicable to the design and management of students, which we'll get into in our next session the following week. But the idea here is sculpting spaces for different types of focus and for different purposes. And the beauty of the furniture is you can move it. Now, some schools buy massive amounts of furniture where they're able to maybe put chairs in diamonds or in different octagons and so forth. I think that's great, but it's very limited. And so one of the things to, to keep abreast on as you're doing the, the, the research here is to begin to look at the newer directions in furniture design. And it is a good place sometimes to do some investing in terms of future purchases. It does give teachers tremendous uh, range and possibility. And I've seen this now in a lot of schools that have limited budgets, but have used, are using their spaces in a different way. Next slide, please. Marie? So part of what we're thinking about with the brain science behind these pieces, a couple of things to notice. Um, we've already mentioned the height and accessibility. Remember what Heidi was saying about the different uh, heights of children, different sizes of children. So notice that these kinds of sitting uh, tools would be accessible to lots of different kinds of students. And I don't need to say I need 10 chairs for six foot children and I need 10 chairs for five feet children, right? Moving them around. Also notice uh, on the walls, uh, this is just a quick note in terms of these pictures, but notice there's a reduction in terms of stimulating visuals. Um, one of the first things we've learned from designers um, or artists, when they go into a space and they want to create new thinking, one of the first things they do is completely empty the space. And they try to not have too many assumptions about old thinking impacting the new thinking. So a space like this with these chairs set up like this where the students can lounge, notice they get neurological stimulation. There's texture, there's comfort, but no old thinking. Very important for going forward. Yeah, I'm just going to briefly, just we will go through this part just again to reinforce how purchases can sculpt space. I also just want to pay attention to when they replace that wall. They use that brilliant use of life and the arced window. The colors are really very soothing and pleasing. Also the floor space too. Thanks, Marie. No problem. Okay, notice again, the large spaces being organized into lots of different instructional options. So I might have a space where I can do direct instruction. I might have a space where I could host an inquiry event. The furniture is signaling the type of thinking that I wanna have in that learning suite or that large space. Now, in terms of this space, I want to highlight that this one originally was a hallway. And notice it's combining, again, that hallway and those nooks that Heidi was talking about, having students choose to look at how they're using this space. It's absolutely gorgeous the way they're using this space. And we used to just walk by it. When I was saying I don't want to have all the instruction in the learning environment, we still now have to think about gallery spaces. These hallways now where students can lounge can now become gallery spaces for their work that they're putting up or the artwork that students are doing. So it just becomes a space that has a whole lot more potential than just being that hallway. Um, one quick thing on that last one. 
you I don't know. have to everyone's heart i just wanted that was the one i also wanted to bring up about the elevated spaces yeah. that that, that to, i think this is brilliant and it's simple you could you could build it in your in your shop classes i mean the point here is it, kids just galvanize they just they go there and they can relax a little bit and 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 that i think is part of the point thanks marie just couldn't help it <laughs> love it <laughs> Okay, so we did mention outdoor spaces before. Outdoor uh, maker spaces, outdoor STEM spaces, outdoor historical spaces. In other words, we've got to stop making assumptions about what we can use the historic, the sorry, outdoor space for. Every content area can thrive out there. Up in Massachusetts, they've been doing wonderful research into these outdoor classrooms, and it's really expanding our repertoire and how to transition to them. Oh, Maine, Maine, I'm sorry, the state of Maine. Okay, is this one up? Oh, okay, for example, how our math is being connected, not just math, but also language development in these outdoor spaces, garden spaces. I do wanna say many of the students, when we, when we were talking about neurological safety, some students, the minute they get outside, as Heidi was mentioning before, behaviors, they step it up. They can function in that outdoor classroom space, and there are reasons why. So the options here of using, if you're in an area where you can access this, fantastic. But I will also say, I was mentioning Maine. They have long winters in Maine, make no mistake, yet they're still breaking ground, revolutionizing their outdoor classroom spaces. So the weather is not really going to stop us if we can plan for it correctly. Okay, so place-based learning, uh, a big conversation we're in right now, the internships, uh, getting credentials. Think about the other organizations in your community. One of the first steps you could do as you're going into this is thinking about asset mapping. Sit down and have a conversation about what kinds of spaces, what kinds of networks exist in your community that you could start having uh, as a classroom connection or a curricular connection with your school. Okay, and then this idea, okay, so the virtual spaces, this is a fun image. Heidi, I expect you to play baseball with me on this one, but the idea of this can happen anywhere. And as our students, I don't know where you are in terms of having your schools have to embrace either blended learning or the virtual learning, but these virtual uh, spaces or the opportunities can connect students to the learning in any locations, Heidi. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I think we can just keep on okay, going. Okay, I'll keep going. Fine. I'll yeah. Just wanted to make sure we had that point there. This is one example of that in action. We have students doing student-run television stations, um, or their morning news broadcasts using different spaces available to them. But one image. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to here. It is. Uh, these students here on the right are actually looking through an electron microscope at the local university, and they have local interns um, working with them and, and supplying the feedback and information that they need. Okay, let me, um, let me show you this for a moment, and I just saw a real interesting question come up about professional development, and, and we're going to continue on. You're going to see where we're, we're going with this as we look at the way um, the names of spaces begin to affect lesson planning and so forth. A um, couple, of, I guess it was about a year and a half ago or so, I wrote an article for um, administra a school administrator. And they asked me to sort of look at this question of, look, uh, we can't all start with ambitious plans. Though I must tell you, be, be careful <laughs> because schools are building new buildings. And too often they go back to an old view of what school is, but it's just got nice material. It's got a lot of glass, but it still looks like an old school. New school design is opening up just in the same way everything is, every other field is. And I think in looking at this, we, we talked about this and I wrote this piece and this is a continuum and it's, being, it's used quite a bit. We'll 
we'll include this and the article, Sarah, in our in our follow up piece. Is that I think that's probably good. Um, and what we're looking at is making moves. We talk about bold moves, and sometimes a bold move is a small move. We'll show you a few quick examples of this, where you can do everything from rearranging furniture to do an architectural walking tour of your school with your kids. Students know how spaces are used much better than teachers do. So <laughs> they'll come up with ideas about spaces you've never heard of. I've seen ideas come up from kids. And nobody's better at this than middle school. I just got to make a plug. Those seventh and eighth graders are just out there and they know where there's a corner or a, a spot or even the use of something like an auditorium that just sits all the time. There are ways to use spaces that exist, but if you do have the opportunity to begin to work in concert, what we laid out were steps along the way and that's what this is. And, and we hope you'll, you'll take a look at it and that it will be potentially helpful to you. Um, let's keep on going here. I think one thing too, that we wanna add in this next image is it's not only the very, it, whoops, is it's not only, if we can go back to one right before. I'm, I'm working on it here. So Thanks darling. There you go, excellent. This, the reason we wanted to add this one is it's also student collaborating with you. This is, look, it's a regular class. It's nothing unusual, but the middle school principal at Deerfield USD just outside of Chicago said, let's have the students make the furniture purchases. And so what they had is the students began to look at variation in height and to look at different ways they could organize their classrooms. And they changed the way the media center was set up. Sometimes students will see ways of, 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 of using that space. The next few slides we can run through are some examples from classroom teachers who didn't have necessarily a big budget to change their room, but they got rid of some of the old ways of setting up the class, began to have parents contribute or bring in furniture or tables, created an environment that matched whatever it was they were studying. And so <clears throat> these wonderful teachers, you can keep on rolling with this yep. one. Thank you. Um, maybe created the mood for reading a nighttime book or you, you're able to do a mystery class or you're able to create an environment that's highly responsive. This takes us directly into an area that is particularly important and I think points to the question about professional development. Here's the 3D rendering. We see a lot of architectural plans. And if you look at the next slide, what you'll see is the um, layout of the architectural plans. When you look at a blueprint, you can see, what you're gonna notice is you don't see the word classroom. So if I'm starting to plan and I'm going, hmm, what might I have my kids do in the learning studio? Or what might we do out in the garden in the garden beds? Or how might we use the learning commons? You think differently than if it's standardized spaces. Marie? The other thing we can notice on this image, which I think is very helpful, is see that yellow center right there, that learning commons? I want you to think about this as where students can muster and be working either independently or in collaborative groups on a learning plan or a self-navigation tool. And I can have one adult supervising, but then I can have, look at this seminar space where every seminar is always recorded. So if a student is absent or not there, they can uh, use it. Notice I have a project terrace or learning studios where if a teacher says, I'm gonna do an inquiry event, we need it in the learning studio and certain students would get pulled out into small classes to do that. In other words, the space is aligning to the curriculum needs at the time. So if I need to do a lecture, I'm gonna be in the lecture space. If I need to do a demonstration, I go to a demonstration space. Now, the, that means these are all the learning environments, uh, in other words, on stage. Notice the grayed out area in the upper right hand corner. This is the area where we consider it off stage. So this is where teachers might have their storage and their desks and a place to work or have certain meetings that students don't get to see, right? So how many opportunities now we're thinking about our physical space as what's on stage, that's for the learning environment, 
and off stage. That's for me as a professional to organize my materials and have my, my time in my space. Okay, so in this, it becomes important now when I'm writing my curriculum to think about what kind of space would I need for that? Or when I'm organizing my instructional event, am I gonna do that outside, inside, lecture space? So what we've really started to think about, especially as we're curriculum mapping, um, is the use, these are the names that Heidi was mentioning before, like what kind of curriculum would I want in the Da Vinci lab? What kind of materials would I be expecting to have in the classics library? We want, that's not uh, Heidi's classroom and Marie's classroom. See, I'm not expecting one space to be all things to learners. I'm expecting all learners and teachers to use the spaces. So kind of flipping it around a little bit there. So we would need to cue ourselves. I did click it. So let's just see. I'm trying to be patient, right? Okay, it didn't happen. So I clicked it again. Now it's going to jump twice. Is everyone aware? Keenan, this is going to be your part. Yeah, it did. It did that. We're getting I, good at it. Did you see? It, like, yeah, I did. I, yeah. Yeah. Right. It, Thank you. <laughs> I think it, was, it would have had a couple here. Hold on. Yeah, it's, I'm it's in steal a hurry. It from memory. It really is. That's all my fault. It's going back now. No, that's okay. We I go. think we're good. Keenan, Here we go. Thinking about ways to signal one another about what space would be appropriate for this part of curriculum or or my instructional piece. Can you help us out with that? Yeah, for sure. So I uh, just wanted to quickly toggle over here. Uh, as we mentioned at the top, uh, what we're looking at right now is Chalk, which is uh, an online lesson planning curriculum mapping solution used by schools and districts. So included in this is kind of a centralized area where you can store and manage all your curriculum maps. But it also gives you access to a robust lesson planning tool called PlanBoard, which is what we're going to take a look at today, just kind of building off of those examples we were looking at of using different spaces. So if we dive in here and what we're just looking at is just a sample day, uh, you can see a schedule in front of you, which is a bit of a spoiler, we're going to be diving into schedule shortly after this. Um, but as we're looking to plan out our day, there's a few different ways that you could kind of incorporate uh, the space you're using and how you're kind of creating those uh, instructions for your students. So first and foremost, when we're looking at something like, I know a lot of this is built around creating those lesson plans. Uh, one thing that you might wanna be able to take advantage of is choosing a template that's structured around how you're gonna use that particular space. So you can have access to different templates, whether you're creating them yourself, whether your colleagues are creating them and sharing with you, or maybe they're set up at the school or district level and made available to teachers across the network. Um, so here, actually, let's just do full screen. It'll be a little bit easier to look at. Um, so from here, we can just dive in and choose the template. So in the case, maybe we're gonna be using that lab. So we wanna dive into our templates and we're gonna choose our lab template for this particular lesson that we're gonna be creating. So that makes it easy. So you don't have to start from scratch. You can use those components. In addition to that, you can also do things like track the spaces. So in this fictional chalk elementary school that we've, we've made up, we have all these spaces, which you may recall from the slide we were just looking at. And if we're gonna be using that lab space, we can track that directly here simply by just clicking and adding that. So this is customizable. Obviously you'd put the spaces that are relevant to your school. Um, and then when we're in here, that makes it helpful for the individual teacher. They can see that that's tracked directly on the lesson plan. If they're sharing that with their colleagues, they can see what resources are kind of, um, excuse me, what lessons are tied to which spaces you're using. And not only can you kind of see that within the lesson itself, but over the course of the school year, as you're doing that, you can kind of take a step back and look and see, okay, here's all the different spaces I have access to that I can work with my students in. When did I use the global forum? What days, how frequently, Project Terrace? You can kind of just take a step back and look at that and then maybe use that to reevaluate or share it with your colleagues. You can export reports on that. And again, you can set this up to reflect the actual spaces that you would have in your school and maybe use that for ideation for maybe future ways you could, you could customize those. So I uh, did want to hand it back to Heidi and Marie at this point, and we'll talk a little bit about that next component, which is more focused on the schedule aspect. Thank Got you. It. That's uh, where we're headed. Thank um, you, Keenan. Thank you very much. And one of the things we appreciate about uh, the platform that you have is that it's very responsive to uh, the design of purposeful templates. And right now, uh, there's a sort of stagnant quality to lesson planning. There's a kind of tyranny of templates. 
And so what's fascinating to me is are those possibilities where we want to um, move forward with the program. And just so you know, um, we are planning on continuing on on schedules. We'll go a little bit after the hour because we've got a lot of material there. And then we'll save the last maybe 10, 15 minutes. We'll see how we're, we're playing it out for Q&A just so you can plan. Um, we know how important this is. And our learning target, as Marie read before, is that I can explore different schedules that respond to the needs of learners and open up possibilities. Think about how that matches in many ways what we were just talking about. So when we look at this part of the nest, what we want to do is basically reimagine exi existing opportunities. But I think the big thing is to open up the menu. More than any of the four structures, this is the one people complain about. Oh, I'd be so creative, but I just don't have the time. Or our schedule, we would just communicate better except for our schedule. I mean, it's a great, great way to put the blame on a problem. It's a way of not dealing with it. Honestly, we get there's restrictions, especially now we're aware of it, but we're, we're victims of our own scheduling. And so in a sense, when you step back and you do see the menu expand, it's pretty exciting. So let's take a look at some things first. And then we have a real exciting tool we wanna share with you. Um, let's just start with some big picture points that nobody talks about. <laughs> Let's start with graduation. Why does it have to be 12th grade? Habit. All of you who work in a high school are fully aware of kids who would be ready for work or credentialing or post-secondary ready for college at 16. All of you know somebody who'd have a much better life if they had another year. We all do, but we don't do this. We do it by habit. We, we, we don't. We are not looking at graduation on the, on the basis of readiness, but the shift is beginning to happen with learning progressions. Pred prediction, by 2030, graduation is going to look a lot different than it does now. It's already happening. And in a strange way, I actually think what we're all dealing with right now in the pandemic is going to be an inducement to rethink the way we support learners. Look at the way uh, we might want to be looking at starting school when kids are ready. Or starting school later, as in Finland. Marie and I and two colleagues did a, an extraordinary trip um, in 2019, actually, in, to Finland. And one of the things that was so impressive to us is school starts at the age of seven and kids are ready for it. Maybe we won't do that in many of our countries. We have people from around the world. But the notion here is that the, the bracketing of time is also problematic. It's not just schedules daily and annual. It's the big picture of how we, how we proceed. And when we get to our discussion on grouping, I think that will play out. Next slide, please. So we're looking also then, we're looking at big picture. We also look at the layout of the academic year. Sometimes you know of schools that are year long schools. Sometimes there's a length of year with some variation in it. So that we might even have some internship components, or there might be a component that's an intensive, where you have two to three weeks for very special types of projects, as opposed to the march through the calendar. And rethinking summer, so it's not punitive. We're also taking a look at the notion, as you see again, and I'm thinking of, of Finland, Marie, where a group of teachers has the same kids for two to three years. So they don't think of a yearly cycle, they think of a three-year cycle. And so the, the idea of the academic year, which is very old, comes out of the late 1890s, is still haunting us with this idea of we've got to get everything jammed in. Next one, please. So this leads us to an important question, and that has to do with what many people would say if we're talking about schedules, they're thinking about this rhythm the rhythm of the week or the AB day or this, and then, and the notion of looking at how we plan daily time and also specialized approaches. To us, this is really one of the greatest impacts on the design of teaching and learning. Marie? Mouse does not seem to want to, there it is. There we go. 
but we knew it was going to happen. So it was okay. We were all prepared. We were ready. <laughs> okay. So the idea of um, ways of approaching the scheduling, uh, we've worked with a lot of schools. And one thing that's pretty consistent is once you shed the industrial model of getting all disciplines done in a chunk of time in a given day, um, there's more than one correct way to do it, right? There's lots of options that are open to you. And more than that, you can even do lots of options within the same year. So we've ended up with these four basic models that schools are kind of choosing between to build their schedule strategy or use of time. The first is an industrial model or a version of the industrial model where you're taking blocks of time and grouping students either by age or by department and having them move through that schedule. Now, there's lots of ways to organize those blocks. Some people have asked us, what's the research on blocks? Is, is it 45 minutes is the best for neurologically learning something? Is it 90 minutes? Is it 120 minutes? Right. The answer is no. It would really depend on your learning target. So I would expect if I'm organizing learning targets and curriculum, I could put how long I think I need for that. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But the idea really is you're not going to find anyone who says 45 minutes is the perfect amount of time to learn anything or 90 minutes. The idea is minimize transitions. You don't want to transition kids 12 times in a day and expect the maximum intellectual experience, okay? So we really want to think about uh, how we're moving the kids through the materials. Another option is to open up a vertical opportunity. If all the students are learning, uh, let's say mathematics at the exact same time of the day, then they could move to different teachers depending on what level learning they need without disrupting their whole schedule. And so by having a vertical block like this, students can close gaps very quickly and move up and down very quickly. An a la carte model is where you've handed the curriculum over to the students on self-navigation tools, or in other words, individualized it and let them personalize it. And they can go to the teachers that they want to whenever they want to. So what happens is they're planning on working on one of those in one of those um, uh, mustering locations, the learning suites we were talking about, and then they can go and schedule themselves to get help when needed. And the last one is called a bidding for time model. And this is where teachers have their curriculum, their learning targets, but they bid for the amount of chunk of time that they need for each of those learning targets, which means maybe in some weeks they get a large chunk of time and in other weeks, very little, just depending on what they needed at the point. But we wanna take you to a website that really lets you organize this in a way or play with these ideas uh, openly. So let me see if this is going to work. Here we are. I've got my great partner, Keenan here helping me. Okay. <laughs> let me know so, if it's working on your end. Go right. Ahead. This is actually, this is called <laughs> unlocking time. And what it does is it realizes you and I have the same number of minutes that Leonardo da Vinci had in his day. And so we sit here and we go, how much can I get done? But by rigidly locking it into an industrial model and transitioning the kids a lot, makes it worse. So they've done a lot of research here. Look at this. They've surveyed over 3,700 schools and gotten information about what they can do with time. You can review the whole report. They actually have organized here options. I'm trying to see if it's going to move. Here it goes into all the different ways to work through time. Remember what I said about those blocks? We're going to have a slide that's going to show a lot of these options and Heidi's going to talk about it deeper, but you can go in here and look at examples. You can go in here and see the research behind them available. Excuse me real quick. Yep. Can, yep. You, can you just scroll down for a minute? I just want the group to also see if you could scroll down. We're trying. Okay. Sure. Uh, Marie, let me know if you want me to give it a go on my end. Oh, All right. if you can go. Yeah. I want to see you take it down because this is something there's some. Keenan, why don't you give it a try? See if you can grab that. And make sure. It work. Here we go. Let's do this. Go. All right. Um, here's an important thing to not just. Uh, well, that's fine. You opened one, and that was okay. And then that's kind of what I wanted to see anyway. What I'd like you to you could open any of them. Um, let's open FlexMod. The thing that this this side is extraordinary. 
and it's free. And it, there's a lot of great foundations behind the research on this. But if you open up any of them, you'll see advantages and disadvantages and also case studies where you can actually go to schools and see it in action. This is an extraordinary resource. And um, I just wish we had had it five or six years ago when we first started to do more of the research and work on this. It isn't everything, but oh my gosh, it's such a jumpstart and it's free. So we highly recommend you, you take a look at it. Thanks, Marie. Oh, no problem. And it really, a lot of people say, where was this when I needed to make all my schedules over and over again during this whole COVID piece? So uh, there are different time strategies. I'm trying to click these pieces to see if they would work. But one tool before we go back to our presentation that I don't want to miss is the actual scheduler. Yeah. So hopefully this will open up for us. Yeah, load it on my end if you give it a second. There we go. Okay, so build a this tool allows you to take your schedule, start and end time, and put in the different kinds of courses you want, and then actually lay it out. And we're going to show you what this can lead to in terms of planning, but we encourage you to go and play in here. Let's go, it's, let's go ahead and go back into the slideshow, if possible. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. There we go. And we should be good. Awesomeness. Heidi, I did click it. It should be coming up. Okay, darling. Thank you. Keenan, did it already go? Uh, not yet. I want to give it one more. There we go. We're on okay, but now. every time I do that, you know what happens. <laughs> you know what I mean? there we go. All right. All right. Um, we're not. I'm not. I'm not going to say much about this. This is just a menu of the options that are um, viewed, and you'll recognize many of these. And we just wanted to take a moment and touch base with you. Um, if we can go to the next slide and which timetable option do you currently use? Is there one you would like to explore? If you could put one, your answer just one, what your timetable is, and two, if there's one to explore, that would be great. Could we put the slide back up though so people yep. can be sort of see um, what and some the, of those yeah. options are? And the trick here on this slide is you don't have to pick just one. In a given mm -hmm. year, you That's can right. shift around within these. In a given week, you can shift around. And so that people are all, well, should I do a block schedule or this? And you're like, it really is an and, but it takes planning and adjusting grouping of students and grouping of adults. Okay. <laughs> all right, here we go. These are okay, great. Lots of traditional. Okay. Yeah, the, the thing about schedule kind of gets baked into our, it gets so habituated. We just get to things being used to the ways we've had them, but oh, it inhibits us. Um, you know, you teach to the time that you have. And in fact, we're going to get into that right now. I think we should, we should sort of move along. Thank you yep. for posting. It gives us a sense of where we are. So let's continue on. And um, let's take a look at this idea of specialized scheduling. And in particular, we want to take a look at bidding for time. Um, next slide, please. And what we mean by this is this isn't part of the daily rhythm piece, what we were just looking at. And what we're looking at is that sometimes you might have an intensive, a specialized field experience. Maybe there's three or four days that you have like a career focus piece or Perhaps what you're doing as an internship, I turns, which are really great, are particularly good, I think, um, for our um, high school kids, where they get an opportunity to really shadow, work with a mentor. Perhaps there's an off-campus service learning project or an opportunity to run a farmer's market. These are very much educative and very important. But what's important also is that we think of time differently. And if we do these, that means we could do it internally too. Sometimes we go, oh, well, that's very special. And maybe we should be thinking more about time as being special anyway, we look at it. Next slide. So one of the key things here is being able to match um, virtual spaces with purposeful scheduling. So you can see how we start to now go back to where we started earlier with the spaces. 
that if I want students to have an asynchronous possibility that could be virtual, I could also say, listen, we want you to make contact on this service learning project on your own time. We don't have to schedule everything. Sometimes we actually share platforms. I could be in class working virtually with another group or organization. Sometimes we want synchronous event-based work. We're doing that right now. We all put it on our calendars. We've showed up. We're working with chalk, but this session is going to be recorded. So perhaps then we do something asynchronous with a group of faculty that's not here. The, the idea is to begin to think of schedule in a, in a more dynamic way that we can be timekeepers, even with the restrictions of start time and end time, there's new possibilities. And one thing we know is that our students have become much more um, able, many of them, to self-navigate using online tools. And teachers have gotten better at their own capabilities because of the pandemic. It's the, it's the one silver lining that's there with all the difficulties and challenges and believe you me, we know that and we are feeling it. Let's go to the next slide because here's the one we're most kind of amped up about. <laughs> and that's this idea of bidding. It is such a professional and smart and grown up thing to be doing as opposed to being this, uh, at, the, at the beck and call of our schedules. We seize this and we begin to negotiate with our colleagues sometimes in five to six week cycles. You, you have incentives for expanding learning opportunities. It's not a special event like the intensive career day thing. It's in the cycle of a way a team works together so that we know we're going to have an opportunity to bid for some specialized time and we begin to think differently. We make it appropriate to the age and, learn, and age of the learner. And the length of the bidding blocks is negotiated by a team. And a team could be a seventh grade team. It could be a vertical team. It could be an elementary group. It, it could be just, it could be actually a group between buildings as well. But the idea is to plan to make time work. Can we go to the next slide. And this one is based on a notion that Marie and I wrote about in Bold Moves. And it's this idea of time as currency. So here's your challenge. Right now, you teach with the currency you have. If you, if you have 40-minute blocks, it's like how you spend a currency if you're traveling. What will 40 minutes get me? What if you started to think, what matches 20 minutes? What's a good activity for 20 minutes? Maybe, maybe Keenan and Sarah are in a writing class, and I'm their English teacher, and I want them to give each other feedback for 20 minutes. Great. What's good for 40 minutes? What's a good type of learning experience? Maybe it's a presentation and then they go into breakout groups. What do you do if you have 90? What if you had three hours? What if you had a full day or a week? You think differently because you get all, we get all baked in and wired to the currency we have as opposed to bidding. If you, if you look at the next slide, where we as a team, say it was the four of us, we were to say, you know what, uh, five weeks from now, Marie and I are going to take a three-hour block. She teaches English. I teach social studies. We're going to watch a documentary, break into groups, and interview the author of the film or the, or the filmmaker. Or Keenan says, I want to do an intensive science lab. Or I don't need the kids that particular day. You guys can have them. I got other stuff I got to work on. Or there's a night program. The, the point here is if you knew you had it, you'd build it. And this is possible in schools. It's absolutely doable. It's our own reluctance and sometimes our inability to just even pilot and try it. Let's go to the next um, slide, please. So one thing that you're going to get in the material and the look out for that email that will come from Sarah is we have a Google form that has been used by teachers all over the world. And in it, we basically say, Give some ideas of what you do with 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 90 minutes. And it's fantastic to see hundreds of teachers come up with all these different ideas as a way of kind of just getting that idea rolling. We're going to ask you to take just a moment in the chat. And if we look at the next slide, please. And we're going to ask you just two questions. First, just put one. What's a good thing to do with kids in your, in your school for 20 minutes or in your classes? 
And if you had three hours, what's something you'd love to do if you had that uninterrupted block? You can do lots of things in it. It's not as if it'd be one thing. Okay, somebody's already jumping on board. Let's take just a moment and let's see what comes up. Thank you. Paint. <laughs> Interesting. Build underwater. Oh my God, ROV. Oh, I love this. Develop their own experiments. See? <laughs> the garden one hits me because we were doing that in Brooklyn, Heidi, and it just didn't fit in into any blocks to get all the eighth graders out there. They wanted it. Yeah. They were in on it. It was, it just took pretty much a three hour block to really get the kids out there and let them garden. Have you ever tried to dig a garden in the middle of Brooklyn? It takes, you know, time. <laughs> Prospect Park, maybe. <laughs> That's a great example. These are great. You get the gist. In other words, we think in terms of just like we were talking about spaces, we think in the time we have. Marie? So Heidi and I have been working with schools all over. And one of the things we've run into is you got to be speaking apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Let me give you an example. When we try to talk about how to plan for bidding for time, I end up in conversations with teachers about contractual days. And then I end up in conversations about compliance for students on instructional minutes per year or minimum instructional minutes per day. Or I end up in conversations with, uh, with different groups about start time and end time with busing, okay, or with lunch. So... One thing that I love about the website we shared with you, and we do encourage you to go visit, is that it creates a common denominator. Let's all talk minutes. So if I have 180 days a year, right, and that's some number that we hold on to, or 220 or 210, whichever it is, then I have to think about what is that in terms of minutes, Okay, how many minutes in a given year do I have as instructional time? How many of those minutes have to be for eating? How many of those minutes have to be for passing? So I talk about um, minimal instructional time per day. If I have five days in a week, then how many minutes do I have? Do I have 360 minutes per week to then divide up? How many maximum minutes do I need per day for my faculty? Because they talk about eight hours. Okay, well, how many of those minutes are on stage? I have 480 minutes with faculty. By making sure everyone's talking about minutes, you can actually plan exactly the way Heidi was going, but you can't talk days and then uh, courses and then talk about hours and minutes. So here's an example of a school. What they did is they created four days, day A, B, C, and E. And they talked about each content area and they gave them chunks of time, right? 80 minute blocks, 45 minute blocks, 30 minute blocks. And I think there's a night, there, oh, look, there's a 120 minute block over there. And I think there's a 60 minute. And then they took these days and they divided them up throughout the entire year so that everyone was talking about total minutes a year. So writing and reading got 8,800 minutes in a year and science got 8,200 minutes in a year and their advisory period, well, okay, their STEAM period got 3,600 minutes a year. It might've all happened in a week. It might've happened, of course, two different weeks as intensives. What this did was two major things, one, more courses got to be offered. Home economics, STEAM, uh, STRIDE, which is their art, music, and phys ed programs, and a transdisciplinary course. If I tried to fit those all into one day, we'd be trading minutes. Flex time was a responsive time, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But what you're seeing now, and I'll just go through these slides, but you can see how they organize the A, B, C, and E days. It's not the same number or type of days per week. Notice some weeks are just A, B weeks. Some weeks have one C. 
Other weeks have two C days. So again, I can't even say minutes per week because it changes. Let's keep going through these slides. I'll look in November. There's an E week. This is where they would do a transdisciplinary project and they'd really dive in. The kids still have those flex periods in those C days to check in. And the other teachers, just so that you understand what's happening when they divide up the teachers, this might be professional development periods when they get to work or take students on an intensive or a field study piece. This is how you make it work in a given year. I'm just gonna keep going through these slides briefly. Again, you'll have copies of these. See the March week. And this is really exciting. Look at how they end. They do one where they have one of those intensives in May and then they flip right back into June. And this is where they're doing some very big authentic performances, which we can talk about more, but they also get a chance to meet with other teams as they prepare into next year. That's what they're planning. So we got a good chance to work with this in different uh, settings. These are two examples, wonderful examples that come from Finland. And one thing I just want to point out is how the teachers have control over these students during this time. And so they're able to start and end when they want, being responsive to those periods without having to obey an industrial bell or necessarily have all students um, following one special teacher's schedule throughout the experience. Heidi, on this one? No, I think that's, I think you're, you're good. We're in, a, we're in a good spot, okay. And another thing that we, we did do to try and prove this, because when we worked with this at the high school level, high school teachers are like, but I'm AP, or I, I have, what about my special ed? And so we actually built this entire schedule out of Legos, and you should have seen it it was so concrete students, real, not students, teachers realized they actually had more time in a given year. And they went, I get, because imagine how better that documentary Heidi was talking about. If you just take three hours, watch it and discuss it instead of breaking it out over two whole weeks, having to restart it, resum up and think about it. Teachers ended up with more time, but I kid you not, they were going around to each other like trading handfuls of time. Here, Heidi, I'll give you two, two 90 minute sessions if you give me four 20 minutes and a, and a three hour. And they were trading time. But by shifting how we think about it, we're able to achieve so much more. So what I was hoping was, Keenan, if you have a minute, can you talk to us about ways we would document, hey, I plan on teaching this. How much time do I really need? Yeah, for sure. And I'll, I'll be mindful of the time here, so we'll make this quick. But did also want to mention <laughs> that documentary thing kind of rung true like a little bit too much. I remember vividly going into geography class and watching like a two and a half do hour documentary over like three and a, like a That's bit right. days. And it was just like, that's just it was very yeah. broken up is the like that stuck out to me it was just funny you mentioned that um <laughs> one of the things i wanted to highlight uh we talked about the schedule before so here we're just looking at the plan board side of things so as an individual teacher this is where you kind of come in create and organize your daily lessons or weekly lessons however you're structuring it and just wanted to show the flexibility of how the scheduler works so in that example of like let's say for example you're working through monologues and you have like the thursday friday are really heavily dedicated to Presentation, presentations and you want to be able to give students that opportunity to have that feedback and things like that um, very quickly and easily at any point in time. So it obviously does accommodate um, like setting up those AB schedules, rotational schedules, things like that, but you can customize it as you're working through the year uh, very easily jumping into a specific day, for example. And from here, if we maybe in that bidding, we've decided on this Friday that that social studies may not be happening and this block may be extending a little bit, we can update that on the fly and have that reflected in our schedule right away here. So we can see that that's reflected. One of the other things I wanted to quickly highlight is it also integrates with your Google Calendar. So as you're structuring and creating this, those changes will reflect over here in your Google Calendar. Um, sorry, let me turn this on, that helps, there we go. 
Uh, all right, sorry about that. It's not showing up and I want to be mindful of the time here, but essentially the calendar events should be popping up there when you're looking <laughs> at it. And as you're clicking on these, you can jump straight to the lessons. So it'll bring you right into your lessons here where you can see the full content and actually work through that with your students. So I'll hand it back over to you, Heidi and Marie, for the just wrapping us out here for the end of the presentation. Thank you, Keenan. Thank you very much. Loved that flexibility piece there. I think that's what we're looking for from technology, right? Is to allow us to be flexible in our thinking. You know, maybe, maybe what we should do is rather than go to the chat um, that we had, we should probably go right to that slide. Yeah, yeah I people think had so. these. I was thinking the same thing. So let's go to 77 and then go to the kind of yep. Q&A. The only thing to think about here, just in pulling our, our presentation together here, is where we started was on the four structures. And we've been looking at a, you know, our brief amount of time with you on spaces and scheduling configurations. And you can also see that the possibilities for that documentary viewing will depend a lot on how good kids are grouped or if the teachers can work collaboratively, that you, you see that. And we also know there are restrictions on places and there's shortages sometimes. And we know this, but within what we have, instead of being victimized by these structures, the more we open up the menu, we can see more possibilities. So um, we wanted to deal with our learning targets, um, the next slide, and then let's just open it up for um, question and answers about the structural nest, spaces and furniture and the implications and different types of schedules. And we really appreciate your attentiveness. So Sarah, we'll leave it to you and Keenan to um, ask us how you wanna proceed. Sounds great. I think we should just jump into the Q and A. Um, Marie, if you wanna to skip to the next slide, we can hang out there. <laughs> um, we got some great questions coming in. Um, through the Q&A. So if anyone has any last minute ones they want to submit, go ahead. But I think to get us started, um, let's jump back into the flexible spaces. So um, uh, one person asked, um, so that they're a science teacher and the lab that they work in is very fixed, um, benches fixed to the floor, lab stools for students, everyone in rows. Where could she start to make the lab a more flexible learning environment in an area like that that's so uh, fixed, but also in concerns where there might be no budget. You want to stick, take it, Marie, to start, and then I'll hop sure. in. Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the wonderful thing about no budget, right? This idea of, um, you know, things are fixed to the floor, they can be unfixed. That's right. I think it's more about putting in a request and, and having conversations with their leadership and safety and grounds and saying, hey, what would it take to get coasters, felted coasters on the bottoms of all these tables and have them removed from the floor and tile and, and you, you can put that now. Sometimes there's gas and water coming up into those tables. So you'd have to really make sure we understand what's going on with those tables and have it professionally done. But if that's possible, then I can move in that space. Another option is also adopting a space that's nearby and opening it up. Very often those rooms are connected to very large closets or burn rooms and, and opening up the space to give them more flexibility in that space. Heidi? Yeah, the one thing I would say for anybody participating already, this almost underscores the point because I'm seeing in the chat some suggestions for that science teacher, is to not start with saying we have an answer. We have a problem. And so we're gonna to start to do some R&D here. What are our options? And Marie's 100% right. You can absolutely remodel. You can absolutely move at those types of chairs and, and, and that rigidity of that seating. Let's begin to explore what our options are. Um, I've, I have seen this happen where maybe we make one or two strategic purposes. Maybe we begin by taking one space, an additional space, that we use in the school that isn't being utilized right now. And we begin to explore that possibility. So in other words, instead of just thinking within your class, there might be a place where we begin to look at a longer term plan. There could be short term solutions, but longer term ones as well. Here's another thing. I would 100% invite your students to come up with some suggestions. 
to begin to look at those possibilities. Right now, the idea is, um, is that was just suggested down in the chat. There were several uh, people right here who were, had had a similar challenge. So I would, I would be begin to take it on as how do we make use of spaces? By the way, one of my favorite physics teachers up in Connecticut, I did something they do in, in Finland. He used the hallways. Mm -hmm. He started to expand the uses in his physics, physics class for some of the problems they were working on that didn't require the lab tables, but in fact, uh, began to look at different possibilities there. So We also saw a classroom where they ran the resources and materials through the ceiling. That's so right. That the teachers could move and there was a tracking system so you could move gas, electricity and water to anywhere you needed in the room. Um, I think the idea, and I'm just going to piggyback something Beth Friedman just put down here, and that is to start with small moves. I think that's absolutely legit. And to begin with some small successes, if that's going to be the way to move. But can I also just say, Beth, that sometimes it's important to start bigger. And that usually is because there's a window of opportunity. It doesn't always happen. Um, I have worked with schools where they did get an opportunity to create a new space or to create a new building. And it goes to the very point that the science teacher was making and also that you're making Beth too here. And that is learn more about possibilities before you act. And, and what I like is to think bold, boldness means we're gonna break out of a boundary, even if it's just, how do we get these chairs out of the, nailed out of the ground and get them out? So I think that's one way of, of working. Um, but one I'd way like, to support excuse me. keeping something small uh, to Beth's question being, we can also look at the brain science Heidi and I mentioned. We worked at a school district that had no budget for a new building or anything or furniture. So they did a PD day where they decluttered. They had it all scheduled and they just decluttered all their classrooms, stopped storing everything in their rooms, and they organized spaces on campus for adult storage. And they just and they thought about neurological safety in those spaces and calmed it down, putting up anchor charts when they should. So, I mean, if you wanna do brain science for $50 or less, you can still achieve a lot of these kinds of things. I think they found a deep sea diving suit that the, one of the teachers 40 years ago used to dress up in and walk around. And they created that as a display piece, but it was taking up learning environment. So something to think about. Here's along those lines. Let's look at the questions posted, as yes. you suggested, Sarah. Nancy's question is interesting because it has two sides to it. At least that's how I'm seeing it. One of them is that in newer school design, we're being much more deliberate about galleries. And also sometimes you can have uh, a big flat screen TV in a hallway that has rotating student artwork or, or, or projects that the whole school gets to see that come from a whole bunch of different classrooms. There's also the question that kind of piggybacking your point, Marie, on clutter. There's a difference between really featuring and appreciating and displaying artwork. It doesn't have to be beautiful. Of course not. But, but there's also jamming up a wall. So it's, what's important here is to figure out the best possibility for whatever it is you're doing to feature student work, but at the same time, do it in a way that is not a distraction. And I think that that's an important piece. So thank you for asking that one. Um, I think this next one is one of the most important, uh, Raquel's, mm -hmm. Marie, that's about- That's a great question. I, do, I really think that. Um, about scheduling that fits with modern research. The flexibles, the whole point right now is that schedules make reading very difficult if in fact you're under very rigid timeframes. And especially in the early childhood years, we know the ideal is two and a half hours of uninterrupted time to do all kinds of things in different ways. So it's when a schedule gets fractured that the, the opportunity for more extended and deeper types of experiences. But here's one thing about reading that we wanna underscore and that it's reading, writing, speaking, and listening, that speaking is one of the most important things that doesn't happen enough. And listening and interacting, you, you read better when kids can share those ideas. So it's not just we have this phonics program where kids are going around in a circle, but there's more rich opportunities for the variation. So in a way, Marie, if you could sort of explain how in the schedule you showed, yep. how you so, would build that in. Absolutely. So language acquisition for brain development, and that's world languages and an initial primary language, 
um, daily minutes matter. And so if I'm doing sound system and I'm doing symbol to sound uh, recognition, every single day had a flex period that was there for um, closing gaps. And some, some of those days, especially the C day, I'm sorry if I didn't point it out, had three flex periods throughout the day. So you had these large chunks of time where you were working on whatever was the trans disciplinary disciplinary piece. But then you had these minutes where it was absolutely slotted for language acquisition, world language acquisition, and then the idea of math concepts, because math concepts to numeracy is also like language acquisition. And you would put it in that, which means that rigorous content would be happening during the transdisciplinary as the applied science pieces. But those flex periods were there because language acquisition is daily for sure. I think um, our last question is uh, is really more of a comment mm -hmm. um, that Aaron is making, and it's a it's a sobering one and an important one. And you know what I was thinking about was um, I had the the good fortune of conducting a webinar with you, Keenan, and one of your colleagues a year ago, and it was we were just seeing the beginnings of vaccines coming out. And it had been a wild ride, 2020. And um, there was optimism. And, um, and you see that. Now, here we are. And we have vaccines. And we do have um, science uh, uh, producing, scientists producing treatments. We, who would know we'd be talking about other letters in the Greek alphabet? <laughs> and here we are. And we also see positive signs. And uh, we don't know, but we do know it's always changing. And we do know it isn't the same as a year ago, but what we've learned is critical. And we are very aware that these are unusual times and unusual ways of grouping and thinking and about the use of space. And we, um, we are appreciative of all that you do. And so it is important to keep that North Star out there more than ever and to say constructive and positive because our students need to see that. And we appreciate all you do, Marie. And thank you for participating, by the way. I'll turn it over to my no. brilliant colleague to finish up here. <laughs> oh, well, um, this is, as you can tell, Heidi and I are very passionate about this structured nest. We really are grateful for Chalk for having given us the opportunity to bring this conversation to you about space and how it impacts curriculum design and scheduling and time and how it impacts the choices we're making about curriculum design and instruction. And we really look forward to our next session where we get to dive into the grouping of students and the grouping of adults. And that would be the complete picture of the structured nest. But your comments today were inspiring and you were just wonderful. So from Heidi and I, uh, thank you. And thank you, Keenan and Sarah, for your time and expertise. Yeah, absolutely. It's been so great to have you too. I just want to do a quick shout out to the upcoming webinars we have. Of course, there's the second part of this webinar series coming up next week on Tuesday, but we also have another series coming up on uh, in March on the 24th and 31st about you know, leaving space in the curriculum for the learners and revitalizing your curriculum maps to increase student innovation. So really narrowing in on the students with those with that series. So stay tuned for registration for that as well. And we will see you next week for the second part of this session. Um, if you guys would like to follow and connect with Heidi and Marie outside of these webinars, their contact information is here. Um, reach out, they love to hear from you. Happy to reach out to Chalk as well if anyone has any questions about us. Um, you know, we're here for your schools, your districts, your solutions for curriculum mapping and instruction planning. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about Chalk and how we can help you, please visit chalk.com slash demo. Thanks everyone so much for joining today. Thank you, everyone. Bye.